Great to be here again <laughs> with you today. Uh, we're going to call this Wise Up On Air. It's, we got a special edition of immersive music coming up for you today. And it's been a little bit. Uh, we took some time out after the Wise Worldwide Online Expo. Uh, this was a two-day event. We had over eight hours of content uh, that we shared with the community about uh, the Wise 21.1 version. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we move forward. But it's great to be here today. I've got some special guests in the wings, and so really glad to be here with the community today. Thanks for tuning in. So, uh, check this out. We're going to look at some of the things coming out of the Audio Kinetic blog. One of the big initiatives here is to constantly be bringing these fresh perspectives on interactive audio uh, to the community. And one of the best ways to get tuned into that is, uh, well, here you are, the live stream, but also uh, in the Audio Kinetic blog. And so you can easily subscribe to that here, drop your email, do a little uh, self-identification, and then we'll deliver this to you and just today, we dropped this great blog about a new Spectrum Multi-Effect community plugin that's been released uh, into the ecosystem. I hope some folks will give that a spin. But really, this is a place where we take in um, different perspectives of people working in the industry. So we had a great article written by Alexander Brandon talking about uh, branching music in Wasteland 3. That was a cool one that came out. Uh, no stranger to the live stream, the folks from Imba Interactive uh, delivered a blog for designing the musical game world of No Straight Roads. So if you didn't check out the live stream when we did that a few months ago, uh, they wrapped that up in a tidy blog for us. And then just Everything you can imagine WISE related uh, has been just constantly delivered for you to educate about the new pieces of WISE and different aspects of this interactive audio life. So hope you find that of value. We also keep these fresh. So the What's New came out uh, with the release of 21.1 uh, earlier this year in March. And we circled back to it recently to, to make sure that, that we were feeding it with all of the different educational materials. So we've added videos for many of the features in 21.1 pulled directly from our WISE Worldwide Online Expo and dropped those in line. So as you're getting the high level of what these new features are, you can actually go deep, deep, deep hands on with developers as they share the ins and outs of these features with you to, you know, depending on how you like to consume information. So definitely jump in to that. Um, as I mentioned, a new Spectrum Multi-Effect community plugin that's come out, a uh, new blog just dropped today. Uh, and the other thing that we talked about on the online expo was this new team training initiative that we have. And this is a way for you and your teams or at, at your company, you're working at your developer and you're trying to get um, you know, a broader perspective on one piece or several pieces of the audio kinetic pipeline. And so we've created this new way for developers to engage with us and we can deliver a, a focused uh, fast track to learning about different aspects of WISE. So whether it's trying to optimize your project and, and how to get the most out of it from a resources perspective, or if you're trying to quickly train up a group of people in your QA department to help identify issues and report on uh, sound-related problems. Uh, super cool stuff. I encourage you to jump into our learning tab and team training here on the blog. Um, because we're really excited to be able to bring that level of education to developers directly. So definitely jump into that. The other piece of this 
live stream that we usually try to get out of the way up front. And, and by get out of the way, I mean really embracing the community out there doing cool things with WISE. And I thought this was one of the coolest things uh, that I saw in the last few weeks. Um, Baby Castles, this is a, uh, a group of folks out in New York. Uh, they did a, a live stream seminar o over a couple of days where they used WISE and Unity to create a rhythm game. So similar to your rock band style, um, things you know coming at you, almost a uh, Beat Saber-like uh, predecessor. Uh, but again, they, they built this all from scratch. You can tune into it and step through the process. Uh, they talk about laying down custom cues uh, in the wise music hierarchy and how they tied that into unity to create ultimately a rhythm game that you can uh, that you could dance to so that was super cool also our friends at frontier entertainment uh, released a video about planet zoo and their use of reverb reflection occlusion and filtering uh, again a developer giving an unprecedented picture or view into their process um, really valuable and, and grateful to have had them on the live stream last year, talking more about their pipeline as well. So great resources from the community, always, always coming out uh, of, with the best intentions to educate and, and lift up the um, user base of interactive audio professionals as we continue to shape and create uh, this art form uh, of dynamic and interactive sound. So really thankful for those folks. So speaking of the blog, a uh, previous contributor that we had uh, contri talking about, you know, why they used WISE as part of their 3D interactive music experience. And this is going back to uh, earlier this year, uh, but I'm, I'm excited to bring to Wise Up On Air uh, our friends, Julian and Robert. Hey. Hey, guys. Hi. <laughs> we did it. It's good to see you. Thanks uh, for hanging out. And uh, yeah, so I'm super excited to dig into this topic, uh, this idea of you know, linear music, it's such an established art form. Uh, it has its own tool sets. It has its own working methodologies. I mean, giant rooms, giant speakers, you know, faders, the whole nine, right? Uh, and at the intersection of that and uh, interactive tools for interactive audio, uh, the two of you have been kind of building this pathway uh, and I want I want to give you a, a second to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about how you've arrived at this place. But I'm super excited to, to dig deeper into the work you've been doing and and how that works within uh, the tools for interactive that are that are evolving. So. Absolutely, Damien. Thank you so much for having us on. We're super grateful to be here. Yeah, we are so happy to share some of the cool things that we've been able to make with y'all's tools. So my name is Julian Messina and I'm Robert Coomber. Uh, so we recently started our company, Fourth Floor, which uh, basically we create, produce, and host immersive music content with 3D audio. Um, and it's something that's long been a passion of both of ours. Uh, we both met at school and basically second day we met each other, we were both seeking out people that were interested in VR and 3D audio. And from there, um, we just took a lot of time after classes and work to just really dive in head first into this topic. And right around the end of school, um, we decided we wanted to really see what it would be like to create uh, like an immersive audio experience um, with the challenge of that most people didn't have VR headsets. So it was one of these things where we're, we're gonna need to target to mobile um, and we're also gonna need to record and produce this in such a way that is kind of unique since most 360 video is a little challenging and how to kind of give a wow factor, um, which meant that we were going to use the same actor who was playing all the same instruments continuously over one shot. And so it meant, you know, 
basically creating our own problems to solve. And uh, right when it got to the end where it was like, well, what are we going to do about the final mix? We started running into an issue where it was, well, you know, within Unity, there were limitations, which Robert can talk about a bit more. Yeah, so Unity audio is just not cutting it for the musical aspect that we wanted to present. A lot of compression was happening, and also uh, Unity's ambisonic output was limited to four, tr uh, four tracks, so first order ambisonics. And that really was not an option for us. And so we started digging. Um, we had already used Wise from one of our classes, and we realized, wow, this sounds, we did some testing, this sounds so much better than what we were able to get out of just straight Unity. Yeah. That's when we, that's when we decided to go ahead and use Wise for this project. And so, and part of the reason why uh, four, four channel ambisonics just wasn't an option for us was at that low of a channel count, you deal with resolution issues. So when you're decoding down to binaural, you start to notice things where there's normalization issues and heavy coloration of sound. And when it comes to music, that's just something that is entirely unacceptable. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's something that has to be represented properly from the artist's perspective. So we knew that 16 channel third order ambisonics was a must for the minimum um and wise was going to be the solution for that and once we started using things like the oro 3d decoder it was almost like it barely even touched the mix yeah yeah well and i think the interesting lens here is of course studios right uh mm -hmm. the expectation is high fidelity right you're you're mixing at, at you know at the evolution of an art form that expects a certain degree of precision with, with the representation of of that artist's vision, right? So then, hearing exactly. how you you know bridge that gap in the move to interactive in order to preserve that precision, preserve that fidelity, uh, working with people who have this expectation that it's gonna sound as good or better because you're bringing this new technology, this new way to access music. Um, that it feels like, um, again, I think you did the right thing trying to reach out to these different tool sets to find the right fit for your production. Now, rewinding it a little bit, uh, and I know you covered some of this in the blog that uh, we'll link folks to in the description and in the chat, but you know what was the setup for for the recording of the music like taking that step back you know what kind of preparations did you maybe do in advance uh with the expectation that you were going to be delivering in an immersive format were there special considerations or um microphone configurations or yeah how did yeah. you wrap your head around that heading into it um so funny enough, uh, there were a lot of variables that we were trying to control going in. So like I said before, we kind of created our own problems and that was a bit of its own web, <laughs> just the nature of the way that we were filming it. But it also came to the advantage that we were going to track in an overdub situation to where we could set up um, like a Sennheiser Ambio mic. And then we also had uh, an optimized cardioid triangle array of five different discrete microphones that we could output to surround. So we were trying to give ourselves options of, you know, what could sound better, what could translate later at some point. And so with all of that, we basically overdubbed each part, captured everything. Um, we actually had uh, a decoder plugin on location to where we could kind of preview like what the microphone was spitting out. And we ran into all kinds of problems. Um, you know, just in the nature of the Ambio microphone in conjunction with other uh, spot microphones, you would experience chorusing, mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of location recorders know is kind of an inherent issue going in. Uh, we also had issues where, you know, the drums were heavily overloading like that particular microphone. So there was actually a big issue in that, like, well, these microphones are, are they're not really presenting what we need. So we actually later went back and I went up and I set up a bunch of balloons and recreated the staging with objects in the way and things like that. And I got a convolution for every single position. And the reason why, and we'll, we'll talk about this more later too, is the reason why the convolutions are critically important is that 
you're trying you're trying to capture reflections to go against what you've already tracked by your spot mics. And if the reflections aren't there, you start to realize as you start moving things out, uh, these ambisonic sources, that it sounds like it's in, in an anechoic chamber. So you have to fill the gaps with convolution reverbs. Well, and, and you said you're talking like spot mics, balloons, like, so you're taking for each microphone, you're taking a balloon to that location. Uh, you got a mic open in the room to capture the impulse when you pop that balloon. And now you get an impulse, uh, you get a an environmental picture of that room from the perspective of that spot microphone that you can then use to give, uh, to fill in the anechoic, right? To fill in the, the exactly. blank space left behind. Exactly, exactly. And, and the critical part of that was it, it couldn't have just been one impulse response. I had to catch an impulse response for the drums, for the guitar, for the piano, because in that space, it has its own, uh, I guess, sonic DNA. Yeah. Uh, it has, has its own reflection characteristics. So for every single one of those buses later in the mix, I would then say, okay, drums gets its own convolution aux. Here we go. So building out from there. And that allowed me to fill out the space naturally. Otherwise, we would have been trying to use microphones that were causing problems or using reverbs to fill in gaps to where it wouldn't give you the natural presentation of, of what it was like being there. In addition to, um, we couldn't just rely on the stereo reverb being an effect that could lift all that up. Yeah, and whenever Julian was uh, doing these recordings for the convolution reverb, I did come a little late. And I walked into the studio and it looked like there was a birthday party happening <laughs> in the studio. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of balloons in here. This is going to do a lot of uh, convolution. This is, going to, this is going to sound amazing. We're going to have to have some confetti and some cake. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sounds awesome. And again, towards trying to accurately reproduce the space from the perspective of each instrument, preserving the isolation of that instrument without the kind of, um, you know, crosstalk or phasing between microphones or between overlapping instruments uh, using a single convolution, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Because, again, these were ambisonic impulse responses. So those channels were already filled out to represent itself later to whatever, you know, spherical harmonic combination to just output and pick up where that was in relation to that microphone. Yeah, cool. And now, so help educate <laughs> me here on the IR side of things, because when you're capturing an IR, um, you're grabbing that impulse. Like, what's the next step? You've recorded it um, with with the array. You like what what happens next with it? Just take me on that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, later I went and did a series of convolving and deconvolving, which in and of itself is a complicated process that I don't fully understand. <laughs> uh, that was definitely a, a tutorial search for sure. Yeah. But, um, but you're importing I, those into into a software like Sur or Altiverb or... Yeah, so once I captured and, and did that little bit of processing on the impulse responses, I brought it into a plugin called Ambiverb. Um, which came out of, again, out of necessity to try and get this to not sound like an anechoic representation. Um, and fortunately, it was it was affordable. I think it's uh, a French company, uh, Noisemakers, who does it. And it did the job perfectly. And in fact, I still use that convolution reverb for kind of my expanded mix workflow um, even now. Yeah, great. Again, just giving folks uh, who are tuned in a little bit of context around the process. I think it's really valuable yeah. to bring that. And and did you uh, so? Okay, you've got the the ambience. You've got it out on a fader. You're ready to mix it in. And and as you're mixing, and to be clear, your process started outside of Wise. It did, um, and that's actually one of the that's one of the points that I'm really excited to bring to people listening is that this wasn't something that was mixed in an, in an isolated environment that was impossible to get access to. 
this was something that I worked on over headphones on a laptop. Uh, and, you know, and that's because of software like Reaper, which allows multi-channel capability and very specific routing for when you need it. And then also an incredible tool set by Deer VR um, with some of their mixing tools. Um, everything they have sounds great uh, and it's intuitive and easy to use to where I can place things, but they also have expanded mix flows that I can kind of branch out, incorporate different kinds of uh, mix philosophies into my mix. So again, th that being the case, um, when it came time to doing the mix, there were, because Rob and I have done 360 content before, um, a lot of delivery options, you know, for like YouTube or Facebook was you could have essentially what is a head tracked element and then also headlocked. And for some time I spent uh, a while just trying different things with, with those limitations. So the big, the big point in the mix was, all right, my delivery even for our own project is gonna be set up to have a stereo or it's, let's say a two channel headlocked and then this third order uh, head tracking type of ambisonic file. So I was able to set my mix up in a way to where, you know, I could get creative and send mono elements that I didn't want moving in a scene or even like low end information to this mono headlock. And as well as send stereo effects that I didn't want, you know, confusing people. Cause another important part of 3d audio is just cause you can put something somewhere. doesn't mean you should. And just inherently in, with our physiology, you know, we've evolved to, if we hear something behind us in certain frequency ranges, sometimes it means danger. <laughs> so you don't want to put people on edge. And especially with effects and you're using lots of delays that you need to be cognizant of, of how that can affect people. So I could play it safe and say, okay, great. I can bring some of my stereo effects in the headlocked. And the cooler part too, is I could even put headlocked binaural elements if I wanted to. Right. Um, if I didn't want that translating, if I wanted something that was fixed in a mix to come across in a certain way to where no matter where anyone was looking, they weren't going to miss it. Got it. Got it. And, and again, this, this idea of headlocked, um, you know, the, the difference between, you know, your unfiltered frequencies, um, mm -hmm. maybe layering in effects, layering in binaural sound, which, you know, is a filtration and uh, allows for this greater precision, uh, you know, to understand positioning. Um, but it does filter sounds in order to uh -huh. achieve that kind of precision. Okay, so yeah. now that's the headlock perspective. Now you've got this other thing, this is this ambisonic uh, piece of it. And what elements are you choosing? It, it, like, was there an easy way as you found your way through it where you're like, okay, well, kick drum, yeah, we're keeping that headlocked and full frequency or yeah, this thing, we're always in the ambisonic with it. Did, were you? Right. Well, this, this was, a this was something that required a lot of back and forth testing and something that I really appreciate Robert being patient with. Cause it's like, here, check this mix, check, check this mix, check this mix. And, uh, <laughs> but ultimately it came down to, um, being cognizant of the spot microphones. So in the case where, like with the drums, there were a number of microphones on that, on that kit. And so because of all those separated relationships between these microphones and phasing potentials. I actually went ahead and made individual ambisonic uh, channels for each one of those microphones. Gotcha. And that allowed me to give a better image to those drums without a lot of intense phasing in between. Yep. But something whereas like the guitar, you know, there was maybe one mic, two mics on it. I could get away with kind of summing those together. Right. Um, You're talking about spot mics too. There's yeah. one interesting interesting thing for each individual track that we recorded, each individual instrument, we had three different versions of it. We had the Ambio microphone, the surrounds uh, microphones as well, and then the spot mic. Yeah. Right. So going between each, all three of those and figuring out which ones we want to include, which ones we don't, which ones sound best, that was, that was really a big balancing act as well. Yeah. Yeah. Towards trying to set the right depth of sound stage and 
Yeah, all yeah. of that intricacy. And for folks who are uh, following along, they're thinking, whoa, sound, it's so abstract. <laughs> I got these words. Uh, we'll have a demo coming up. In fact, a, uh, a hot drop of cool sounding immersive music uh, from these folks. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and yeah, hang in there. Uh, we're going to keep talking about immersive music. We're going to keep talking about some of the cool tricks that uh, that folks are leveraging. And I think uh, I think it's great to have the two of you to provide this kind of context to your process, because for a lot of people, they might be new to this idea of music going beyond a surround channel format. So mm -hmm. I wanted to unpack your perspective on binaural a little bit. Yeah. We kind of waved our hands around it a little bit here a second ago. But like, what do you feel like the binaural element really brings to uh, an immersive music mix? Yeah, I mean, I kind of got chills thinking about this. It's like binaural to me is a, a pretty incredible way to output content again for all of us now who are on headphones um, and on the go you know there's opportunities to have a much more immersive experience now again in order to make a better binaural experience like something that we were kind of touching on a little bit with a you know, minimum channel counts for ambisonic files was that you need to think in higher resolutions and to get to a higher resolutions means you need more information spread out and to explain that as simply as i can um, kind of from like more of a physics standpoint, if you're able to spread out that information, that energy, um, you're not going to have huge buildups when you're kind of looking around. And so being able to move that around, you're actually creating more opportunities for separation, just like you would in a surround format, being able to move something over to different discrete channels. You're not relying on two channels to handle all this energy. So you're able to move it around. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, as things improve, I don't see there being a situation in the future where we will not have our own individual HRTF, where all of us have our own unique way of hearing. Um, what's to say that's not going to be a part of my, uh, <laughs> one of my preferences that I can upload. Yeah. And, you know, even Sony talks about this too, with the PlayStation 5 being able to pick different HRTF profiles uh, for people when they're using uh, headphones. So, Again, I think it's one of these things where it's incredibly promising um, and it's only going to get better with time. And there was definitely reason to be skeptical at first because I actively look for different decoding solutions in terms of being able to make sure that a mix that I'm putting out in binaural uh, sounds as good on speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I want to stop you for a second because one of the things that comes with that headphone personalization, right, one of the reasons why that is a a goal of this technology, right, is because it continues to drive towards a, a person's ability to locate the position of something, right? Mm -hmm. It, it more, accurately, more accurately translates the positioning that's encoded in a, in a channel-based or in a object-based format and delivers that to someone in a way that they understand and in the way that their their physical uh, self, right, their personalized um, physiology responds to inherently like, oh, this is tuned to my, the way my body is shaped, the way that my ears are shaped. Uh, mm -hmm. And in that way gives the greater um, positioning of these sounds and again distributes the energy in a way that we're used to like personally used to so exactly. i think that's where that's where something like 3d audio on a ps5 there are five presets uh right now that you can choose between and you tune those you tune those uh i think it's very uh interesting the way that they chose to present it as something that you orient uh, the the position or the level of the um, water sound. It's like, oh, okay, here's a, a river sound. 
position the river using these five presets so that it is, you know, at or underneath your your horizontal listening plane, right? Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. It's amazing. Uh, and, and from that, then you wade into things like Returnal and Demon Souls and, you know, Sackboy. And it's like, oh, okay, well, this is tuned pretty good. I get it. Wow. Things do sound, uh, there is a height and a depth, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. With that eventuality of personalization, um, really being that fine tuning of that without the need to audition or, or tune yourself to it, right? Things just become right. tuned to you, so. And of, of course, and this is a conversation that spreads out in, in so many different ways too, like, you know, even existing, existing technology now, Robert and I are very like, you know, problem solution oriented, like what do we got now to fix the problem? Like, I wish I could just take a LiDAR scan in my ear and say, okay, great. Let's just extract that and move on. Yeah. You know, but like, but that's the exciting thing about all this, even in this conversation is these aren't things that are far out, you know, a lot of them are here now. Yeah. And that's a lot of what we're trying to articulate is that, you know, we're here to help bring that into the fold now. Uh, yeah. because it's something that we want to see ourselves. Cool. Cool. And so you've got these mix elements coming together um, you're doing this all, uh, you know, on a laptop, rocking some headphones, you got your tools and your technology, you got your stems, you got your effects. Uh, at what point do you make the leap out of what we would call a traditional, um, music tools environment? Uh, you know, again, your, your plug-in architecture inside a Reaper, being what I would think of as traditional, uh, even with some immersive, immersive helpers from uh, from the likes of of Dear VR, but mm -hmm. now we're going to make the jump out of that traditional music tool set. Like, where does that yeah. go next? Where did you go uh, in order to to make that next leap? Well, again, just coming from a world of familiarity and, and how we're used to working. Um, I like to think of things in terms of delivery and to be able to stay in the DAW as long as I can means I can stay in my comfort zone, but it also means I can bring other people into the fold of the comfort zone as well to really exploit what we know how to do really well in that tool set. But when it's all said and done, you know, Robert and I essentially exported um, an ambisonic, you know, file, the, th the third order, and then our headlocked, which was functioned as a bed. Yep. Um, so for the time with that project, you know, we only had two, you know, separate interleave files, which then we created our, our events for built into a sound bank, uh, set up our RO decoder and, and we were ready to go. Uh, essentially, I mean, there was some other work where Rob literally had to build a video player from scratch, <laughs> which is not an easy task. You know, audio is hard, but that's way hard. Yeah. And, um, and Rob, that's the unity side of things where where you're yeah. setting your scene. You want to talk a little bit about, you know, what you had to do to enable the audio that was being created uh, in the box in the traditional music certainly. tools and how you use unity and wise to kind of bridge that gap. Yeah, certainly. So well, as Julian is doing all of his end inside of wise inside of Reaper, I'm setting up all the visuals and preparing for that package from Julian that basically the sound bank from Julian, bringing it into unity. And, uh, for this project, uh, this was before we really had a grasp of timelines. So we just set up basic play events and pause events, resume events inside of Wise that Julian set up. Yeah. And I just hooked up all of our uh, specific buttons, start events uh, to these things that Julian set up. And it was really quite simple um, once, we, once we already had the app built out, getting that audio into it. Um, there was a couple issues with some specific iOS notifications. That's always, that's always super fun to play with. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, um, 
it was it was simple and now we've actually moved on to the time unity timeline cool um with wise and that has really simplified a lot of those issues that we were having initially so yeah it's, it's actually the the workflow that we have especially with music can be quite simple versus doing a full game um all these crazy events uh rtcp yeah yeah uh, levels it's it's really really a lot easier for that sure well and coming from linear music the expectation is i press play it plays the same every time right exactly you're not doing a whole lot of uh random variations on the snare drum right like uh no, it's got. <laughs> yeah. Don't touch their snare drum, please. <laughs> right. So, so in that way, it simplifies that expectation, and again, the integration, and again, painting a picture. You're you're in Unity. You're orchestrating some kind of visual accompaniment to mm -hmm. the music that's being created, and we're gonna foreshadowing this a little bit for folks, right? We're gonna see and hear uh, your current work uh yes. represented in this way but so just to give people the context from the game side of things you know it's a 3d scene in unity it's got uh bouncing balls or uh, video playback or, or whatever it is um represented in a 3d scene and ultimately you know wise is there to play back sounds positionally in that 3d scene mm -hmm. in whatever way that makes sense uh Wise is there to playback sound uh, in that headlocked uh, configuration, right? Without any kind of uh, head tracking. Uh, and so ultimately it is a very simplified representation, but a very powerful way to express and uh, I would say choreograph or orchestrate um, the interaction between the sound and uh, the music. So. Sound, music, exactly. visuals, yeah, those. Exactly, and you know, using Wise, we'll be able to scale things up in the future. And then, as we're incorporating building into our app, you know, dealing with other like UI sounds, things like that, you know, that that's already handled. And it also gives me the opportunity to experiment with other people and say, like, you know, what happens if we put a seven point one point four bed here? You know, yeah, and, and and playing with things like that, you know, and switching between sync devices where it's like. Okay, well, we've got a cool binaural experience here, but you know, what if I want to watch this on my headset in my living room and I've got surround? Super cool, right? Yeah. So that's that's really like, you know, the big important part of this. And then, you know, on the Unity side too, and I'm, I'll let Rob explain this too. Is you know, we're familiar with working with video, you know, and 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 the challenges that that brings into it. And so, one thing that I know, at least for me, it, it, in the beginning, which was kind of intimidating, was to just see software that you were navigating between windows to kind of play along with this linear aspect. And it was like, no, we need a timeline. Um, and having this non-linear looking system meant that I knew just in audio and then also programming kind of automated moments within what you'll see soon. We could also bring in other creative creatives, whether that be a director or someone who specializes in lighting and say like, look, here is the start and the finish of it. Like, Let's just go ahead and through the timeline and program out what we need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So taking a step back, question coming in from the chat. The question is, and I think we're talking so far somewhat abstractly about uh, your first adventure into this uh, mm -hmm. with the Dirty Laundry uh, app, right? Mm -hmm. And the question coming in, you placed 360 video uh, in a sphere or something in Unity, and the music is in sync with that and kind of playing back linearly. Was that the experience in the Dirty Laundry app that's already out? Yes. iOS, go grab it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what was happening. Cool, cool. So thank you for that question from the chat. And, and we're going to get a little peek here in a minute about something that is reaching in a little bit of different direction. If I if I'm not spoiling anything, uh, do you want to set that up a bit, and then we'll give folks a uh, a taste of what's coming? Uh, tell us about the uh, the experience we're going to have with some of your new work coming up soon. Yeah, we're this is like a, a 
pretty incredible moment for us in that, you know, we've always wanted to build something that was using visuals constructed, you know, uh, basically using 3D assets that we could have full control over and give us the highest fidelity because, you know, 360 video is just not the right format at the time. I think it'll get better as volumetric capture, like, improves, which will be really cool. I'm, I'm still <laughs> holding out for that. Um, but for the time being, you know, there's, again, tools and assets at our disposal now that look amazing. And we should be taking advantage of that. So Robert and I essentially built the content that we want to see um, ourselves. Um, and it, again, it's going to improve over time. But it allowed us the opportunity to really say, OK, I want you know, a piece of audio attached to here. I want to play with movement. I want to see things in sync um, and kind of have that feeling of well, like a music video, but uh, more not just immersive, but to really kind of put yourself in a scene to really have your entire sensations covered. Exactly. In sync, yeah. reactive, dynamic, it's in the flow. And, and maybe in some cases, you know, the mix can change, the mix can evolve. You can, you can choose, you know, one week, uh, you know, the drummer is like, yeah, that fill is wrong. Uh, <laughs> you pull the fill from the mix, but actually, on the on the game engine side, maybe you didn't touch anything, uh, and and everything still dynamically reacts appropriately because you're leveraging that interactive piece, right? Exactly. So the visuals yeah, the are thing, driven by the mix in that way. And the same thing goes for visuals as well, yeah. with this real time aspect that we don't have to render out a video, we don't have to have pre recorded shooting. We can, if we see something that we want to change. We can just change it right then and there. We don't have to go through this entire process, which allows us a lot more creativity and flexibility creating these visuals and audio. Plus, I don't know, custom shaders are pretty cool to look at too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So we got a lot to talk about uh, after folks have had a chance to to put their eyes and ears on what uh, you, you're presenting here today. But, yeah. but set this up set it up a little bit more anything else you want to say about it before we cue that video and and music example um set it up and then we'll kind of tumble out of that into i'm sure a hundred different directions about where this is going yeah absolutely so this is kind of a preview into um an alpha scenario for what we're creating um and what people will see is again a real time uh, presentation with 3D assets with audio that is fixed and attached to things and being able to translate head movement. So what you're seeing is what Robert and I essentially captured from uh, Quest material. So this is running in VR on, on, on the Quest. And then in addition to that, um, later on, there will be a section, an A and B section. The A will be going between the audio that's tracked and then the B will be just a standard stereo. Apologize in advance. I had to recreate a mix I wasn't expecting <laughs> to get to broadcast, which uh, again was a pleasure. But you'll hear some subtle differences in, in timbre. Um, but essentially, yeah, when you see that A and B, it's switching between spatial and then and fixed. Cool. And I think an experience probably best uh, done with headphones. Mm -hmm. So we'll give folks just a second to get cabled up if they're not already for that experience. Uh, and where's the music coming from? What's who's the performer? What's the uh, yeah. context? So um, I've been really fortunate enough to work with a good friend of mine, Blake Ruby. Uh, I worked on a record with him while we were in college and uh, it was an incredible time. He's an incredible musician uh, and very creative and, and open. Uh, to trying things. So we had started with that Dirty Laundry app and he's been showing me some music back and forth recently with uh, some stuff he's going to have coming out at some point. And I remember hearing one song in particular and I was like, I got to use this. This is like, this is perfect for what Rob and I want to try to demonstrate to people to, to get them to see our vision. And so he was, he was kind enough to let us use the song um, for this piece. So that's that's where that originated from. And we've got other artists too we're gonna be 
reaching out to to kind of build their own like immersive experience with too but uh blake was was instrumental in this yeah also a little shout out to blake he's got a new song out today called a lot less happening yeah so go go stream it yeah awesome good to have friends in high places uh, <laughs> and with that i think i'm going to roll the fourth floor vr uh alpha demo of this uh featuring music from blake ruby uh again get those headphones on uh there's some really cool stuff happening and following the video we'll we'll uh we'll come back for uh you know a further discussion about where the technology is going if you have questions get them into the chat um it's about four minutes long and i'm going to roll that here now story had to be told and I don't fit the mold what if my golden years flew by and I already played my part wasn't I just about to start am I anything if I can't sing so I'll wait to see tomorrow I'm so afraid to cry. Cry, 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 Excellent work. Excellent work. And you're right. Shaders are cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I think it all hopefully pulls together for folks out there who are following along. We're getting some good uh, 
reactions in the chat to uh, to what people are seeing and hearing. Uh, Want to talk us through any of the any of the cool things? I mean, just there's so much there, uh, and what a great audio visual experience. Uh, I just want to say first off. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, yeah. Any any cool tricks you want to tip us off to from for folks who might be watching after the fact and they're just going to jump back and watch the video again? Uh, what was Absolutely. cool that they might have missed the first time? Um, so a lot, and again, this was kind of in what we were talking about before, where working with these 3D assets, we're able to look onto wise workflows where we can attach emission components to these 3D assets, which then allows us to have a lot of control with how that behaves. Um, something that I know Robert and I will get into with more complicated material in the future is having the flexibility of you know real-time reflections, but also being able to do cone attenuation, doing RTPC setups to where you know we can play with mm -hmm. with volume and other aspects of timbre. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, a lot of other things too. I mean, it's almost limitless capability with that. But again, it's this, it's this aspect of control and proper translation. And so when I hear something like that over headphones, especially with emission, and the fact that I can set it up to where I'm not gonna have huge changes in, in volume and where the dynamics are gonna get messed up, it's, it's great. It means I can look there and, and the same intensity is still present no matter where I'm at. And that's, that's a really critical part of this. And again, too, the clarity. Um, you know, we were afforded clarity in, in that I could do my bed in 3D with my decoder that I want to use and have an accurate representation of the rest of the mix that will be fixed or not fixed. Right, because you've got elements that are positioned objects like that floating sphere that, that, that was the voice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an object, you've got the voice uh, track pin to that mm -hmm. uh, and as your head tracking around you know sound is staying with that and like you're talking being able to control the spread based on distance or using azimuth to control some kind of filtering um, you know really using it to keep that clear in the mix keep it um, in the right place because because maybe you actually when it's when you turn your head all the way around you still want to have some of that uh yeah and and to go into that more like rob and i produced the content in such a way that we could really emphasize other aspects of the performance where you know we have these moving shots which you have to be really careful of for a vr user because you're talking about motion sickness and things like yes. that <laughs> but here's the really cool part about what's happening is that in this example and it was meant to be simple for this reason that we could set the lead vocal, which is our main focus, just as it would be in a song or you know on film, and keep people locked to that. So in essence, we turned your head into a gimbal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so that keeps you locked in to whatever you need um, and stable. So using sound when appropriate, like I was saying earlier, to if you're gonna have something that's moving in space, it's a good idea to attach it to something. Uh, yeah, well, I think we, as human visual creatures, <laughs> uh -huh. help uh, having a visual location for something helps us position it with our ears, right? The accuracy of our ability to locate something comes with that visual aspect as well. Right. Yeah. There's no surprises. Yeah. And that was one thing that we had a lot of fun with was creating these visuals, um, determining, okay, what do we want to actually react to a vocal um, or a specific drum track, bass track, whatever it is. And there's also things in it that are rhythmic that are not actually tracked to any audio that are triggering on different beats, different parts of the songs. Um, so really determining, yeah, what what we want to see, you know, just kind of closing our eyes, listening to the song, just thinking, what does this look like? Uh, and being able to recreate that visually um, is amazing. Right. Now, what's the combination of, you know, 
puppeteering on the timeline for the graphics and some of the things that are beat synchronous versus actually sending information from wise as a game parameter that you're using to make the visuals dance sure yeah so uh what we did to make the visuals dance uh was we actually were pre-processed a lot of this audio into animation tracks um, using blender gotcha and those animation tracks we were able to really smooth out a lot of that data because just normal sound even if it's uh just specific tracks an audio track it still is pretty noisy um visually going off of intensity or, or whatever it is so we were able to really uh, filter that audio to where it is a bit smoother coming out into the animation that you were actually seeing. Um, so that's really how we did that was each in, in Blender, each individual track, we were able to export these uh, filtered animations for them. Gotcha. So you baked out the amplitude of your tracks as animation, brought that back mm -hmm. into Unity and used that to, to modulate visual aspects yep exactly yeah we just put those uh, values coming out of the animations right into whatever shaders or scales um whatever else we were using to drive those those visuals gotcha and that, yeah. that gives you a lot of control over again like you said the smoothing out of dynamics uh maybe you don't want it to reflect the the range difference all the time you want to smooth out some of the high spots maybe bring up some of the low spots and so having that control in the animation side feels like uh, well really resulted in something incredible yeah and and a, a big part of this and something that um rob has been teaching me uh on a recurring basis is you know the name of the game is optimization you know <laughs> so finding finding ways to shortcut and make sure that we're asking less of the hardware to do work um, has been a really interesting way to produce content because you know in in some ways that i know people are familiar with at least you know working with film it's like you're always faced with a challenge and things that you can't do <laughs> yeah and try to find what you can so it's been nice to recognize these opportunities of like well we want people to see this on this particular hardware. So what kind of corners are we going to have to cut? The creative constraints of, of a low spec platform, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, exactly. And, and yeah, the, I often find that that drives the creative solutions. Uh, exactly. So, and, and there's definitely a lot of creativity going on in that video. Uh, Question from the chat. Uh, did we hear any kind of spatial processing? Was was the output uh, leveraging any binaural plugins or any other um, spatialization? Yeah, so in this case, um, and kind of the way I like to work, the, this demo was meant to like really make a stark difference between like what is locked and what is headlocked. On future mixes, I'm going to have a lot more layering of, of things occurring. But just with people that we've been demoing to, I, I really wanted them just to kind of get it right away yeah. and not distract them too much. Yeah. But I will say the headlock that you're hearing has been mixed out into a larger format and processed and rendered down to binaural. Okay. So that's kind of a specialized thing I don't really want to go too far into, but it, it is after work of expanding mix mix flows. Yeah. Uh, so there there is processing on that. But even that bed, if I understood maybe your setup, still has some content that didn't get touched by the binaural processing. Is that true? Yeah, some in some ways all some certain elements out yeah. that haven't been touched by it. Yeah, because again, the binaural processing, while helping with positioning and panning and and all of that uh it does color the audio and in some cases it, can remove frequency uh content totally and again that's where people will have to do their own research into what decoders work for yep. them um but i i will also say we had touched on the topic of convolution earlier and again just in the way that we needed to render things out 
um, using the, part of the reason why I didn't just do a stereo mix on top of an emitter was I needed to create a sense of presence and space. Yeah. So doing that whole mix, a lot of it was just to add those subtleties. I mean, part of a good mix in stereo is, you know, people will add tons of reverb and tons of delays layered on top of each other and you don't notice it, but when they're gone, something's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, okay, so let's talk evolution though. So we've been talking about this idea of of a bed, right? And I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna do a little translation now as we shift into future focus, right? Um, mm -hmm. You've so you've got this content that you want to preserve the frequency integrity of, right? Kick drums mm -hmm. or you know, hi hats, whatever it is, right? You mm -hmm. maybe you don't want those to hit binaural processing at any stage, uh, and you want to keep it headlocked. So in WISE, we have in 21.1, a reconfigured pipeline that, that allows uh, for three different categories of sound. Uh, and the first one is called the, the pass-through mix, okay? And this is the, the frequency content you wanna preserve. Uh, you don't want it to touch a binauralizer at any point. Um, and so this is where that content um, arrives at the end of the WISE pipeline. That next uh, path that we have in, in WISE 21.1 uh, is called the main mix for us. And that main mix is something that, that can be processed using a binauralization technology uh, if the user or listener has it enabled. Uh, but if they don't, it's just going to get mixed to a channel-based format without any kind of binaural processing. Uh, and so you can direct things to this main mix. And again, depending on whether uh, spatialization is toggled on or off, it will either be processed or not. Uh, and then this last category of sound, which I think is where we're going to start taking this conversation, is objects. So mm -hmm. leveraging individual audio objects um, and carrying their positioning information all the way to the end of the rendering pipeline. So leaving wise, uh, preserving that positional information, preserving each of these sounds uh, and their location all the way to the, the end point or the renderer that's going to take and recombine these three things depending on what settings uh, exist at the output. And you kind of alluded to this here a minute ago where you said, yeah, well, I don't want to distract anyone with the technology. I want them to hear this just clear mix that I've, that I've done. Uh, and with the newest version of WISE, of course, you can, you can author for that best output, right? Taking advantage of these three categories of sound um, while ensuring that, you know, if, if people don't want to hear the, the uh, binaural processing of, of a, a technology like um, Windows Sonic or Atmos headphones or DTS Headphone X, uh, Oro 3D, you know, if that's disabled, they still get the best representation of the mix, um, but it makes it simpler for you because you can just mix it once and have it propagate appropriately based on the user's choice, right? Exactly, exactly. And for in film, like we call that like a sync point, you know, as to what device is, is translating that out. And the using the ambisonic aspect of this is so cool because we're talking about a sound field we're talking about 360 degrees that essentially can be extracted into a discrete output and so again it's just adding to the layers of flexibility and and then who knows i mean at some point maybe we'll be up to seventh order and <laughs> where we're outputting for something like that but um yeah part of this conversation going into uh you know old to new and, and to future. Um, there's a lot of talk about 
uh, immersive formats, especially with where Apple's going and incorporating Atmos. And um, generally, when I talk to other people in the industry, just on the music side, they're they're gearing up for having to deliver for immersive formats, and there's a lot of anxiety in that. Um, just you know, the, the technology is not super simple to understand right away. It takes some research, but also, you know, if someone's going to going to invest in a mix and mixing for one specific immersive format, what happens if now they're required to mix for multiple and especially with a cost like that? And one of the things that I'm looking forward to again, using wise is that wise has already covered itself and scaled itself for the future to where I would feel more confident in saying that, you know, someone who's mixing in Atmos now, it's like, well, you've already made your bed. Um, why don't we just go ahead and say whatever was an object, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and pitch as an object within WISE. So you've already delivered for Atmos and what was required for that. Fantastic. Now let's just extract some of those components and we'll, we'll be able to translate it over to what, what we'll provide for you. Yeah. Well, in WISE, they've always called it cross-platform compatibility, right? And, and so, you know, being able to create your interactive audio once uh, and have it propagate across all of the platforms, you make your individual mm -hmm. tweaks. And I think what, to what you were just saying, the, the extension of that is, um, you know, these different spatial formats, you know, mm -hmm. in WISE, we have a line to be able to essentially mix once for the, the highest possible um, and best audio representation uh, while giving people the tools to be able to tailor it to different solutions without having to do a total remix every time. Uh, so exactly. And retaining fidelity. I, again, I have to really like stress, you know, to you guys being able to just trust what we're putting in and to like what we're getting out. It's huge. Nice. And just this future proofing um, to anyone listening, it's, and, and thinking about this, like it, it's a good idea to start thinking about how people are going to be listening, not five years from now, but you know, way into the future. Um, and I feel much more confident using tools like this while being able to still retain my own workflow within the DAW. Right, because you're preserving what you, you're taking everything you know about uh, mixing music, right? And and the and the leap doesn't sound like it is too far to be able no. to extend this uh, into an interactive tool set in preparation for this uh, format uh, to be able to yeah. deliver it. Uh, yeah. And I think we're, we're at this tipping point. So the interesting thing about 3D audio, right, is that it's becoming more and more accessible, right? What does it take to experience 3D audio today, it takes a pair of headphones and an environment that you can can toggle it on and off in. Your Windows environment, your PS5, uh, you know, mobile platforms in the future as we move forward, uh, and so it's that first step from a well, from I'm out there listening to music. Uh, in title, you can have 360 um, content delivered. Um, it's one of the formats they offer for certain um, certain titles in their library. Um, so we're getting to this point where there's an accessibility for someone who's interested in trying out the technology. Like you said, mm -hmm. sometimes it can be a distraction if it's not what you're expecting. But okay, we're taking those steps. And the other piece that I think, well, you're absolutely have put your finger on it here today is the accessibility within the tools to be able to not only author for it, but again, to be able to audition, right? You're saying, hey, I'm, I'm in the box. I can flip the switch on and off. I can go between listening to a fully spatialized mix, leveraging all of these layers and the binaural technologies to, you know what, just give me stereo. Stereo with mm -hmm. none of this fancy positioning stuff. Just, I wanna play it back for the producer and, and they don't need the whiz bang right now. They just need to know that my mix is awesome, right? Yeah. 
Uh, so it's that that other piece of the accessibility of having the tools at your disposal to be able to to flip the switch that I think that is yeah we're we're arriving quickly, and today's conversation was a, a great illustration of that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, question from the, the chat coming in, and this is just a, a little open-ended for you. What about AR, VR? Like, like, we talk a little bit about the headphone side of things, and that extends into just simple linear playback formats, but, but what about head tracking your time maybe with the quest recently uh, or with other vr formats uh, i don't know do you do much ar on your phone like is is this still something that people should be thinking about as either a platform or an extension of their title eh, thoughts on it certainly yeah and that's something that we think that's what we are really pushing for uh and that we really believe in um so with vr uh, specifically, one thing that we love about VR that is impossible to do with anything else is uh, you can imagine listening to a song, closing your eyes, thinking about what that looks like with your eyes closed, and we can do that. We can build that. Yeah, it's crazy, <laughs> yeah. and it's so cool. And we, you know, understand that VR isn't in everybody's hands right now. Uh, which is a little frustrating, but it is constantly growing every single year. It's just been growing and growing, especially with the Quest. Uh, a lot of our friends have Quests now, which is amazing, and we're able to share to a lot more people. So we really believe that the best way to experience music is through this medium of on, you know, inside of VR with your entire uh, world transformed into what the artist, the music artist, wants um, you to see um, rather than just closing your eyes and what they want you to hear and see you know it's what you actually will be seeing so that always just inspires us that just keeps us going just knowing like yeah this is this is going to continue growing and will be the coolest thing ever uh, and with AR AR is definitely a little tricky at the moment um, especially with music uh, one thing that we really like AR for is Instagram filters, Snapchat filters. Uh, we actually had one, um, speaking of Blake's song that came out, uh, we released a filter for that as well. Uh, so if you want to go to Blake's Instagram, we've got an AR filter that just dropped uh, today as well uh, for his for his new song. And we think it's a, AR is a great tool to promote and share a portion of these visuals. You can really kind of get a peek into it, um, especially with you know cell phone technology now. It's really the only way to experience AR. You can kind of get a peek into it. Um, it's more like a window into that world, less of you being there in the world. Um, but it definitely allows a lot of uh, creativity and uh, sharing, promoting, and being able to play with a song, play with some visuals without needing that full headset experience. So I pull up the AR filter from Blake Ruby's Instagram. What's it going to do? It's going to like rain chocolate and rainbows or what? Exactly. It does rain <laughs> chocolate and rainbows. No, it's uh, <laughs> so we have a short portion of his song playing um, on the filter and then there's a couple of visuals, a uh, little crown that you get with the title of the song, a lot less happening. And we have a shirt patch that uh, gets applied to your shirt with Blake Ruby's little logo on it. And then we also have, in addition to that, there is some shader wizardry that we've been doing. Um, and whenever you tap on the screen, the entire visual changes and you are now this very colorful transformation of yourself that is kind of all trippy and moving and it's playing with the music uh, and there's a bunch of different colors that people have been playing with so that's the majority of what what that uh, filter is doing at the moment awesome yeah folks and much of and much of where rob and i's philosophy is to kind of summarize that is um we provide kind of a wraparound of getting people into a real-time space i I think we're all beginning to transition into what that's going to be like. So we're, we're here to provide a real time service. Nice, nice. And it sounds like you you have the diversification across a few different mediums. 
Uh, and so mm -hmm. folks can reach out to you uh, for these kind of things. I know we put some information into the description, uh, but tell us again the name of the company. This is Fourth Floor. Excellent. So we'll drop some contact information and how they can get in touch with you. You did a little promotion on your Instagram about the new filter, maybe? Yes. Cool. Yeah, we got it. We've got it on our story. We're going to be posting about it more as well. Um, and we'll make sure that you'll anybody will be able to try it uh, just from going straight to our page. Yeah, and feel free to anyone listening. They can reach out to us via the Instagram as well. Uh, we'll be we'll respond to that. Perfect. Well, and that seems like an easy way to stay in touch uh, about future developments. Uh, again, I would say th thanks so much for uh, letting us premiere this uh, alpha footage uh, today. And, and the conversation has been really great. Thank you, Damien. Yeah. Likewise. It was awesome. We'll see you again soon. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I agree. I expect to be seeing you very soon. <laughs> so... Uh, Thanks again to everyone in the chat. It was great to have some questions and be able to weave that narrative in. Uh, and I hope that folks get their ears and eyes on this new and emerging technology. Uh, some really exciting opportunities out there for folks to audition, experience, and start playing around with it as a format uh, in WISE today in 2021.1. Uh, we hope that you circle back with us and let us know what you get up to with it. Uh, again, always interested in highlighting the cool things happening out there in the community. So, uh, again, Fourth Floor VR, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care today, and we'll see you soon.